Okay, chapter two, thinking like an economist. There's a couple things we need to cover to figure out how we better think like an economist. So I want you to do a thought exercise with me real quick. We have to make a lot of assumptions. Why do we have to make a lot of assumptions? Well, as economists, we're taking a static look at a very dynamic situation. What does that mean? Static is like a, a snapshot, okay? Uh, dynamic is something's always moving, okay? So um, what you guys have to understand, uh, by the end of the semester, you're going to have some keen insights into economics, but again, let's keep in mind this is a cursory, elementary, early look at what is economics. And the first thing you have to understand is we have to make assumptions about a dynamic world to make it more of a static situation so that we can make assumptions and simplify and uh, take a look at why the, sell, the, the sales of Doritos was up and the, the purchases of Coca-Cola was down. Um, so to do that, we have to make a lot of assumptions. So we, just a word of caution, what we're doing here, basically we're going to cross a four-lane highway, all right, as a group. Um, in fact, no, I'm going to send you out there one by one. And in fact, I'm going to blindfold you. And that's how we're going to look at the economy to start. So we're going to make a lot of assumptions. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to take a snapshot, a Polaroid, you know, hand it to you and show you what traffic looked like five minutes ago. Then I'm going to put a blindfold on you and send you out into traffic. It's not really wise, right? So keep that in mind. Be humble or be humiliated in economics. Um, to take a static look at a dynamic situation, we have to assume that traffic isn't going to change from that photo and you're going to cross the road on a lot of faith. Now we know in the real world, you're probably going to get hit. All right, so we're taking a static look at a dynamic situation, which means we're making a lot of assumptions, which means we're oversimplifying a very complicated situation. All right, so keep that in mind. The importance of assumptions is so that we can study one little aspect of the economy like that while it's moving like this. Okay, so the economy is constantly moving, it's dynamic. We're taking a static look, just a little look at one little small part of it. So assumptions help us do that, all right? So why do that? Well, it beats not knowing what's going on in the economy and getting surprised by everything and not having some wisdom over time to help us uh, lead more productive and efficient lives. So how do we do this? Well, we make a lot of assumptions to simplify and then we derive what's called economic models. Now, our first economic model that we're going to look at is the circular flow diagram, all right, which I've crudely drawn here. Uh, there's a couple things that I want you to look at right off the bat, all right? There are two markets here. The markets for goods and services, MKT for GNS, market for goods and services, and then the markets for factors of production. Those are the inputs that they need. So for example, Michelin North America uh, makes tires, lots of different types of tires, but they have to have inputs. They have to have rubber, steel, they have to have transportation, they have to have labor. All those things are inputs. So. Um, let's go this way first. Markets for goods and services, you know, firms like Michelin, uh, they send products in there, that's goods and services in, but back they get money. They take that money and they buy inputs from the markets for factors of production. We have households, they buy things from the markets for goods and services. If you ever bought anything, left your house and went to Target, whenever, you know, went somewhere, went to a tire dealership and bought Michelin tires, whatever, you gave them money, they gave you stuff. That says stuff. Um, households, in return, give markets for factors of production things like inputs, like labor, like their time, like they work for Michelin or they work for uh, a rubber manufacturer or whoever. Um, and in return, they get paid for that or they sell them the land for BMW to build a new plant there. Um, they give them inputs. This is an oversimplification of a very dynamic situation again. So you've got money from the markets of the factors of production going to households. They spend that money in markets. Firms get that money and in return for sending goods and services and they buy more inputs, all right? It's a continuous cycle. It's a continuous cycle. Again, an oversimplification of a very complicated uh, relationship. Here's the thing. I like the circular flow diagram. It's very elementary, it's very basic, but it's also very elementary, it's very basic. Um, I don't think I'll ever ask you to draw it or anything on a test, but you need to know that there are two different markets. There's a market for inputs, and there's a market for outputs, okay? Uh, some of those inputs come from households. They get paid for that. They spend them in markets. Firms sends goods and services to markets. 
get money in return and they buy more inputs. All right. Uh, to illustrate this, uh, I'm in the upstate of South Carolina, more specifically Spartanburg, and one of our biggest employers is BMW, who uh, manufactures BMWs just down the street here. Um, it was a huge coup, economic develop, uh, development speaking, uh, for the community to get BMW. Why? Jobs! Well, who employs more, BMW or the companies that came with them to supply things like leather and steering wheels and brakes and transmissions? Actually, believe it or not, the bigger employer here, this is the flashy one, this is BMW, this is who you hear about in the newspaper, but the more jobs come from the markets of factors of production, so that's why it's more closely associated with households. All right, moving on here. Another type of um, economic model here is the production possibilities frontier, or PPF. I'll let you read about that in the chapter. Um, it's very, very simple. It has a vertical and a horizontal axis. The vertical axis, this is zero down here, and this is product A, and this is a lot of product A, okay? For product B, this is zero over here, so zero output, and this is a lot of output, being really specific here. I just want you to get the idea that over here is zero, over here is a lot, down here is zero, up here is a lot. So this is the relationship between making two different products or services. Um, if I produce zero product B, okay, I can make a lot of product A. If I produce zero product A, I can make a lot of product B. Okay? Chances are I'm going to make somewhere in between. I'm going to draw a line and dot it right there and break right there, and that will tell me how much of product A and product B I'm making. Now, why is this line curved? Why is this line curved? Shouldn't it be a linear relationship like this? A on the vertical, B on the horizontal and it's a linear relationship. Well, let me ask you something. The first time you made something, it took you a while, right? The second time, a little less time, third time, you're getting pretty good at it. Fourth, fifth, twelfth time, you're not even thinking about it, you're really good at producing it. The same thing is true whether you're making peanut butter and jelly sandwiches or BMW vehicles. It's not a linear relationship in that there are gains in efficiency. The more you produce product A, the more this line bows out. The more you produce product B, the more this line bows out. So. In practice, you're going to start this chapter with linear production possibilities frontiers, but it's actually going to start bowing out because human beings are a wonderful thing. We get really good at making something, and we can make it faster. So that's why you see the bow in it. Now, in the, in the, in the homework, you'll see in the initial stuff and some of the reading, you're going to see some straight lines, and that's just assuming a linear relationship where no matter what you do, um, you're still at the same ability level. Now... What if it increases? What if there's some sort of gain in technology, some technology that allows you to make, say, more of product B? Well, guess what? That changes our production possibilities frontier. Let's say product A, the gain in technology, doesn't really help it. So it stays there. But product B, we can make more. Okay, so this line can shift. Now, if it shifted on both, it improved the production of both, so you can see this line moving. Now, if you had some sort of uh, loss or something, you could see it retract as well, but generally speaking, when we're looking at economic growth, we want to see growth like that. Now, okay, Teach, what does this mean for me? Is it applicable to my life? Well, yeah, I'm just a college student. What, what can I do? How can this help me? Well, let me show you how it's directly applicable to one of the 10 principles that we talked about in the last chapter. Cost of what you get is what you give up. And, you know, looking at opportunity costs. And let's say you're making a decision right now between study or econ. And let's say semester, we're chapter two, so semester's pretty early. Let's go have some fun. All right. So right now, let's face it. The relationship, and I'm going to go to linear here just to show you that as well. Let's say, I assume you get better at, at your econ. I know you get better at your fun. But let's go linear, PPF. And so right now you're at a lot of fun and a little bit of econ. Well, as the semester progresses, you're going to have to even that bad boy out. You're going to have to have less fun and more study. Okay, so a production possibilities frontier, production means uh, what do you get from your inputs? Well, what are your inputs as a student? Your input, your key inputs, time and money. You've paid money to, for tuition. You're paying with your time, which has a monetary value as well. Um, how you take those inputs and get an output. 
okay? At the end of the day, yes, you can get some output from fun, but why are you here is to learn. So make sure you're taking advantage of um, your time and being very productive and efficient, taking a little less time to study, you know, to, to, to have fun and more time to study. Now you'll get better at studying and be able to have more fun later. So you can be more efficient with your time and eventually you'll see these start to bow out. I know economics at first is notorious for um, having linear production possibility frontiers and that you don't get any better at it, at least at first. But if you're doing the reading, watching the videos, you're looking at this lecture right now, you're taking notes, you're jotting down notes, you're starting all the homework early, um, you will see this bow out. And by the end of the semester, okay, even before the end of the semester, but towards, towards the halfway through the semester around midterms, you're going to get pretty good at this if you establish a routine right now. If you don't, you won't get much better at this and you'll be dealing with a linear production possibilities frontier when you should be looking at a bowed production possibilities frontier. All right. I'm um, not quite done with chapter two, but we're done with this video. Uh, next video, we're going to talk a little bit about political aspects of the macro economy and looking at uh, the economist as an ac um, uh, economic advisor. I'm um, going to talk about well, what statements in the news are real and what's not. Stay tuned.